So for everyone, thank you for coming today on behalf of uh, the Board of Advisors. Thank you for taking time to support Texas Christian University, most importantly, the students um, as we work through today. I want to highlight two things, and then we're going to go straight into the presentation. Um, first, I want to congratulate everybody in the room. You may not know this, but you are actually participating in what is called American Innovation. You are actually participating in how we in the United States develop innovation, technology, capabilities, um, and then, to the best of our ability, reach across the democratic free world, right, and help countries do that. And so why do I say that? There's been tremendous study about different economic systems. You have the European system, the Chinese system, Latin America, South America. What is most important and different about ours? is that it's the combination of academia, industry, and government coming together to solve. The charts that you see here that were presented earlier, our ability to get to the, to the moon was based on that holy trinity of getting together and solving those problems. And innovation does not just occur in the lab, but it occurs in the office of finance. It occurs on the shop floor. It occurs at the wellhead. It occurs on the pipeline. And so today is exactly about that. Now, what's the topic for this uh, panel? Policy. Policy is the act of government's thinking. Policy is the act of government's learning. Policy is how institutions communicate intent to bureaucracies, to citizens, and to markets. And that's the topic of today's conversation. I'd like to take a moment to introduce our panelists and then I'm going to ask the panelists to present about five minutes some opening comments. Following that, I'll ask a few questions, but then quickly open it to the floor. And as you've been told, I am not Russell Gold. So let me first start with Robert Bryce. Robert is an author and journalist and film producer. He's host of the podcast, The Power Hungry. Um, he is an acclaimed author of six books on energy and innovation including most recently, A Question of Power, Electricity and the Wealth of Nations. Bryce's books and articles, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, that's right, uh, have been translated into six languages. His articles have appeared in an array of publications, including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Forbes, Real Clear Energy, The Hill, the Austin Chronicle, and The Guardian. He has also appeared in dozens of media outlets ranging from Fox News to Al Jazeera. The next panelist is um, the Honorable Ambassador Andras Shumoni, former Hungarian ambassador to the United States. He is now living and working in Washington, D.C. He is the Managing Director for the Center of Transatlantic Relations at SICE Johns Hopkins from 2012 to 18 and presently works with the George Washington University School of Engineering and Applied Science. Prior to moving to the United States, he was Hungary's ambassador to the US from 2002 to 2007. He was the first Hungarian ambassador to NATO, becoming the first permanent representative of the democratic country of Hungary after the country's accession to the alliance. His prior assignments also included Deputy Chief of Mission of Hungary to the European Union, which is today the European Commission. Our third panelist is Dr. Dean Foreman. He is with the American Petroleum Institute, and he is the chief economist and expert in the economics and markets for oil, natural gas, and power. Dean has more than two decades of industry experience at companies, including ExxonMobil, Talisman's Energy, and Saudi Arabian Aramco in forecasting, market analysis, corporate strategic planning, and finance and risk management. And previously at Exxon, he lived here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and is actually very happy to be back. Um, he is known for his knowledge in energy markets, applications of advanced analytics and, uh, to assess market risk, and clear and effective communication with both management industry relations, and investors. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, this is the panel today to talk about policy. And I'd ask Robert to kick us off. Good. Thank you. Turn this on. I think better on my feet, so I'm going to stand up. 
Um, and I'm going to be provocative and also, I think, truthful here. Energy transition, what energy transition? <laughs> I wrote a piece for Forbes at the end of last year. Energy poverty is the standard around the world today. Last year alone, roughly 260 people were burned alive, immolated, while trying to collect a little bit of motor fuel. This is a photo from, a photo from Haiti, an accident in December. A, a, a fuel tanker truck uh, 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 overturned. People ran over with, with gallon jugs, trying to collect a little bit of free gasoline, an errant spark, an errant cigarette. They were burned alive. Similar situations in Kenya, in Lebanon, and Sierra Leone. These happen with incredible regularity, particularly in Africa. So this idea of an energy transition, in my view, is a Western conceit. The lot of people all over the world is energy poverty, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Here's a graphic using uh, 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 denominated exajoules here. We could put it in barrels of oil equivalent. The result is the same. Since 1985, roughly $2 trillion spent on renewables, and today, wind and solar have 4% of the market. Over that same 35-year period, hydrocarbon consumption grew by almost 10 times the growth in wind and solar. This is what I call the trifurcated donut. A friend of mine in Austin, Seth Myers, and I made it. Um, it's in my book, uh, Question of Power. High-watt world, low-watt, and unplugged worlds. We live in the high-watt world where consumption is more than 4,000 kilowatt hours per capita per year. Low-watt world, 1,000 to 4,000. These countries aren't necessarily poor, but they're not among the richest. Think Chile, Poland, et cetera. And then the unplugged world, where consumption is less than 1,000 kilowatt hours per capita per year on average. 1,000 kilowatt hours per capita per year is the benchmark why that's how much my old kitchen refrigerator consumed. How many people are living in the unplugged world today? 3.3 billion people. Four out of 10 people in the world today are not talking about the energy transition. They're trying to get enough electricity to have their kids read at night, to refrigerate their food, to cool their homes. This is the reality in the world today, denominated in a, largely by electricity poverty all over the world. Energy transition is not a topic that these people talk about. Four out of 10 people in the world today. Okay, so energy transition. We're gonna go to renewables. Okay, well, my friend Lee Cordner says, there are three things you have to think about when you talk about electricity. Where are you gonna put it? How are you gonna connect it? And how are you gonna pay for it? And increasingly, the problem is, where are you going to put it? And not going to be uh, confrontational here, but there are companies in this room who have sued local communities to force them to accept wind turbines. And I had a piece in Forbes last Friday about the issue of Madison County, Iowa, one of the most famous counties in America, sued by one of these companies to force the county to take wind turbines the county clearly does not want. If this were the oil and gas industry acting like this, it would be front page news in the New York Times. The New York Times will not report on this, even though New York State is arguably the epicenter of the backlash against the wind business. Shasta County, California is in here. So is San Bernardino County, California, the largest county by area in America, does not allow large scale renewables. It's not just wind, it's solar. I have a piece that's going to be published in Real Clear Energy tomorrow talking about this. That in fact, since 2021, the beginning of 2021, NBC News reported just a few days ago, since the beginning of 2021, more than 40 communities, at least 40 communities across the country, have rejected or restricted solar projects. Solar has 10 times the power density of wind. Doesn't mean people want it in their neighborhoods. People everywhere care about what's in their neighborhoods. I hate this term, NIMBY, not in my backyard. Everyone, everywhere cares about what's built in their neighborhoods, and damn well they should. 
wind energy rejections. Again, you won't read about this in the New York Times, the Washington Post. You sure won't read about it in, in National Public Radio, which has published pieces in the last few weeks that I think are beyond terrible in terms of journalism and what is happening in rural America. Last, uh, this month in California, a, w a pending wind project was rejected. The count now by my data, I collected this data on my time, on my dime, 325 communities from Maine to Hawaii have rejected or restricted wind projects. Seneca County, Ohio was one of them, and then the other one was uh, in, Ca in California just uh, this month or last month, 325. The wind industry's never quarreled with these numbers because they don't want to talk about it. So what about connecting it? Where are you going to put it? How are you going to connect it? Uh, I think uh, Professor uh, uh, talked about this before. Uh, Stathis talked about how you're going to connect it. Finding the amount of data or good data on high voltage transmission finally found some data from C3 Group in Atlanta. The amount of 230, uh, uh, volt high, uh, 230 kV transmission lines built per year since 2008 is roughly 1,700 miles. NREL says to get to 90% renewables, we have to double high voltage transmission. That's 240,000 miles. Well, we better get cracking because it's going to take, at current pace, 140 years. The grid we have is largely the grid we're going to have. If you think it's difficult to put a, how many of you built an oil and gas pipeline? How many of you tried to do it, permit it? How many of you think it's easy? Try and do that same pipeline and put it 200 feet in the air. The numbers for high, high voltage interstate transmission is about 200 miles per year. Electrify everything, the grid is cracking under existing demand. Oh, we're gonna electrify transportation. This is DOE data, again, my graphic. The number of blackouts, unusual disturbances, according to the DOE, up 13 fold since 2000. And yet we're gonna add a whole lot more demand to the grid. Well, what does that mean? It means booming sales of Generac. Should have bought Generac stock about a year and a half ago. It's up fourfold. The queue for Generac delivery is about a year long now. Okay, so what about wind? Oh, well, we just need more wind. We heard this after the winter storm Uri here in Texas. Oh, we just need more renewables. We could cover this whole state, ladies and gentlemen, with wind turbines. We can't make the wind blow. And what happened in Europe? Wind droughts. This is from a Reuters, this is a Reuters headline, utilities need better storage, okay? Again, talking on, uh, following, I didn't plan to present slides and then I saw Stoth has had slides and I thought, okay, well, here we go. Let's talk about batteries. What about better storage? Okay, so I just, I just changed this slide this morning. So Texas, we use on average 1.1 terawatt hours per day, 1,100 gigawatt hours per day. Math is easy, it's so easy I can do it. Tesla Gigafactory produces 50 gigawatt hours of battery storage a year. Therefore, to produce enough batteries to supply Texas for one day, you have to have the entire output of a Gigafactory for 22 years. Statha said we, we need 47 terawatt hours. So again, 47 times 22. Well, if he's right about 47 terawatt hours to, to uh, make renewables and renewables alone dominate in Texas, we need roughly 1,000 years of output from a gigafactory. And I could show you, I have slides on prices of lithium, cobalt, nickel, neodymium. I could go through all of that, I won't. But what about coal? Okay, so batteries, what about coal? Well, suddenly, oh, the energy transition? The price of coal in the Newcastle marker just hit $400 a ton. Now it's come back, but companies and countries all over Europe now are looking for coal. The coal market is stretched to the limit. There is, no, uh, there is no surplus capacity of coal available anywhere in the world today. This is indicative of what I call the iron law of climate. People, businesses, and countries will do whatever they have to do to get the electricity they need. And I've been all over the world in the last six years, Lebanon, Iceland, Puerto Rico, New York, India. I've seen it in Louisiana. People will do whatever they have to do to get the electricity they need, including burning coal. Last points, what about affordability? What about the poor? What about the middle class? I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, I'm disgusted. <laughs> but the democratic rhetoric is fundamentally when it comes to this energy transition, anti-poor. You know, we hear the president say, oh, EVs, EVs. This is the mobility equivalent of let them eat cake. Tesla's raising their prices, why? Because the prices, the commodities needed to put into electric vehicles are skyrocketing. 
the material intensity of electric vehicles is far greater than that for internal combustion engines. Then what about the affordability issue? This data was published in the Federal Register just a few days ago. This idea, oh, we'll electrify everything, prevent direct use of natural gas. Well, you're imposing a regressive tax on the poor and the middle class by forcing them to use electricity. And this, the data is denominated in per million BTUs. I haven't changed the denominator. It's in the Federal Register. It was just published. You're requiring them to buy energy three and, three, and, three and a half times greater than the cost of natural gas. A little land yap here. What about nuclear? I'm adamantly pro-nuclear. If you're anti-nuclear and anti-carbon dioxide, you're pro-blackout. I'm anti-blackout. But now with the Ukraine war, the Russians are essentially out of the game. Rosatom, which was the big company that was commercializing nuclear around the world, is essentially out of the game. The U.S. now is just stuck. President Biden did not use the word nuclear energy one time during his State of the Union address. Chinese are building 46 reactors. We're building two. And there are none in the queue behind that. I'm easy to find. I'm on the Google, on the interweb. That's my Twitter handle. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. I didn't know we were selling books. Oh, we always because, are. The always because, books. No. no, no, because, <laughs> because I would have bought a copy of my book, which is called Rocking Toward the Free World When the Stratocaster Beat the Kalashnikov. <laughs> so that's my book. But anyway, what is not in my bio is that I'm actually an honorary Texan. Thank you. <clears throat> I got the documents. I got the documents signed by Rick Perry, <laughs> Governor Rick Perry. And uh, a couple of years ago, we were in Lithuania together at a big EU-US conference. And he was, of course, the guest of honor. And you should know that when a, when a secretary of energy travels to Europe, he's kind of treated like a semi-god. And no one, no one could approach him except he walked up to me, and we, we talked for about half an hour. And after the conversation, the others asked me, well, what were you talking about? Well, I said, you know, we talked energy security and strategy and Russia. What we were actually really talking about is he told me the story how he got on stage and played drums with ZZ Top. <laughs> so I just wanted to, <clears throat> in, in way of introduction, a couple of things I want to say here. Um, we were kind of talking about Ukraine uh, quietly in the background. I think uh, I don't think climate change is is, is uh, really the 800-pound gorilla in the room. It's actually Ukraine. The question: How we got here? Um, how we got here is that we, the West, sleepwalked into this situation. That's how we got here. And um, Energy has a lot to do with it because, uh, because those of us in Washington who kept telling consecutive administrations that Nord Stream 2 is a disaster, that the Germans should be talked into not allowing uh, Russia to build an extra pipeline, circumventing Central Europe, circumventing the Ukrainians, because it's a security guarantee for the Ukrainians we were laughed at, and we were warmongers, and we were called all kind of uh, things. But uh, as we see, the Russians have Germany by the neck. I thought it was funnier, but anyway. <laughs> okay. But what I want to say, there are certain aspects of Ukraine that you might not have thought of. First of all, on the 24th of February, when the, when the war started, Ukraine switched on to the European electricity grid. This is an unknown fact which is really, really important, which meant that Ukraine really sent a message in terms of uh, energy cooperation. We want to be part of the West so they moved from the Russian grid to the European grid. Two, um, Ukraine was going to be a very, very important part of the green transition of Europe. 
You see, Ukraine, and this is something most people don't even know, Ukraine has an abundance of sun, wind, nuclear, and what is even more important, it has space that the Europeans don't have. So this whole issue of uh, not in my backyard is not an issue in, in, uh, in Ukraine. Um, and now that's gone. And I know that the war in Ukraine has a lot to do with Putin thinking, this green transition is not good for me. This will make my uh, hold on Europe go away. So he saw a window of opportunity when the West was weak, when the West was dependent on, on Russian gas and oil, and, and also uh, when the West was looking in a different direction, and he decided to invade Ukraine. What this will mean long term, I have no idea. But I guess there was a before and there is an after. And I, I think it is uh, important for the Europeans to rethink uh, how they will rebalance the climate agenda and the secure, energy security agenda. Way too much, way too much stress has been put on the climate agenda and too little concern for the energy security aspect uh, of, uh, of the world. Just uh, one more thing I want to, I want to latch on to uh, what Bob said. By the way, my good friend uh, Scott Roy from Range Resources keeps telling me you got to watch his shows and his videos, and so you should know, you got a fan club out there, a real fan club. And, and I, I would, I would, so energy poverty is not just a danger between the rich countries and the poor countries. It is a danger within our own societies, including the European Union. You see, it would not be a great idea to see Amsterdam, uh, Paris, Berlin, Brussels breathe fresh and clean air while all the dirty stuff goes to Eastern Europe, which happens to be part of the European Union. So we, we have to be very, very careful about how we go about this. Uh, I wanna just mention two more things. One, at the same time, I do believe that we do have a climate problem. I'm not sure we're going about it in the proper way. I'm not sure we have figured out how to fix it. But I would uh, argue that at least mentally, the Europeans have, have really put this at the center of their economic recovery. That's a good thing. Uh, and I think they're doing a lot of, lot of good stuff that we might want to look at. Uh, but there is no magic bullet. There is no silver bullet. And I think it is important to understand, and this brings me to my last point, is that only if the United States and Europe work closely together will we be able to rebalance energy security and climate and find the solutions that actually will lead to a more secure transatlantic community and also find the avenue to a reasonable and possible uh, climate action program. The last point I want to say is, where well, there are a couple of us who are, and you can hear that from our accents, that who are Americans by choice, right? Um, <clears throat> my friend Philip, who is sitting, Von der Bush, who is sitting there, hi, Philip. Uh, we had a conversation this morning and we came to the conclusion that our job here in the United States as immigrants is to tell Americans by birth to believe in this country, to believe that we can lead the world towards a better place.
that we are the ones who have the possibility to come up with br bright ideas, inno innovation, uh, outside the box solutions so that we can present that to the world and once again become the leaders of the free world. So I'll stop here and, uh, and happy to discuss. Thank you. Dean? Okay, well, I should be mic'd up. I, I should yep, you're that. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me here. I, as you introduced, actually lived in this area for about 10 years, and this was from the mid-1990s to early 2000s, and at that time I was working as the only economist in ExxonMobil's corporate planning group here in headquarters in Irving. And since then, I've been a treasurer in the upstream. I've been part of the executive team of an exploration production company in Canada, so I lived in Calgary four years, came back to the US, worked on the downstream side in a petrochemical project, a $10 billion project that is now in operation. Then I went to Saudi Arabia and was in their corporate planning group before API called. So I've been the chief economist at the American Petroleum Institute for four and a quarter years now. And you may know API as an advocacy organization, communications advocacy, lobbying for the, for the industry. And we are the organization that has you know, close to 600 member companies. It's through the entire value chain. The history is as a standard setting organization going back 100 years. But we're also a primary data source. People don't know this. We survey up to 90% of the industry every week. We publish weekly, monthly data. It's out there. You can get it. You know, connect to me on LinkedIn or through our website. Happy to discuss. But it's the supply, demand, trade inventories of crude oil in the US, natural gas liquids, and every major refined product. And for more than a year, we were the outlier. We were the ones with the data saying, you know, after this downturn, it sure looks like energy transition, substitutability, everything going on, that as the economy was coming back, the demand for oil and gas would come with it. And quarter after quarter, by the time we got to the third and fourth quarter last year, we were saying not only is the demand coming back toward 2019 levels, but the supply, the investment, it, it can't keep pace. It's workforce issues. It's supply chain issues. It's finance issues that we haven't really discussed here today. But it's also now energy policy headwinds that have been piled on. And to you know, not get too much in the weeds with it, the knee-jerk reactions to prices going where they've gone recently have been everything from wanting to reban the exports of natural gas and or crude oil in the United States to put Nixon-style price controls on energy in the United States. We have the Southwest Power Pool with a proposal before the Oklahoma Corporation Commission to cap natural gas prices. That doesn't help when you absolutely need a market response in prices to attract natural gas. I participated in the last two years extensively both at the Texas Railroad Commission and the per rationing hearings about oil and gas. Oklahoma actually did it. They pro-rationed natural gas and only unraveled those regulations this past April. What a costly experiment. They lost more market share than any other natural gas producing state. So it's one thing as the industry to say, look, we can look at a climate imperative. It's its translation into economic health and affordability, which has largely fallen on deaf ears. The administration and even the state level interests haven't cared too much about that. This forum is interesting. Now I speak um, both virtually, but also at a lot of universities. And there aren't many where you have an open dialogue where you can, in a session about the energy transition, openly talk about oil and natural gas's role in that. It's almost taboo at this point. And part of it is because there is a consensus of where the world needs to go. There is a belief, as Bob McNally was saying, that it's going to happen yesterday, that the technology is coming. But API is interesting. We've got members on both sides of it. We've got ones that are fully all in with the energy transition and electrification, electric vehicles, biofuels, you name it. And we have others that are very much tried and true in the industry as it's been. And we're sort of agnostic. We, we think we need all of the above. The thing in terms of demand that I can give you towards this energy transition notion 
is that EIA, the U.S. Energy Information Administration's estimate as of December, was global demand for liquid petroleum fuels of 101 million barrels per day. With some seasonality, 100 million barrels per day this quarter. When I was at ExxonMobil here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, I can tell you before the shale revolution, when we looked at projections of economic growth translating into liquid petroleum fuels growth of 100 million barrels per day globally, there was no one, even internally, that really believed that was sustainable. It was a question of where this might come from. And the shale revolution in the United States flipped this completely. In less than a decade, we went from being the single largest importer of energy in the world to being, by 2020, a net exporter. Remarkable progress. But what's happened in the last 18 months is also remarkable. With a drop, and it seems like not much, right? Let's compare first quarter 19 to today. First quarter 2019, we were exporters of about a million barrels per day. This quarter, it's the opposite. We are importers. This translates. It's less domestic production. It's import dependence. And as of last week, we had the lowest crude oil inventories in the country since the same week in 2014. So net-net, the data tell us this is a tight market. The EIA's ex estimation coming into this year was a deficit of 3.2 million barrels per day to start this year before Russia, Ukraine. And then you go through the story. And Bob's final slide was actually wrong in terms of one key number. The consensus expectation for growth isn't like a half million barrels per day or even one and a half. The US Energy Information Administration globally has three and a half million barrels per day of growth this year. And the way they assume this, and EIA, the International Energy Agency, the official forecasts, both now and out the long run, are not alarmist because it, there's an old joke about being an economist. If you're stranded on a desert island and all you have is a can of food, but you don't have a can opener, what do you do? And the, the economist joke is that you assume that there's a can opener. <laughs> and that's what's happened at the official agency level where the meeting of this three and a half million barrels per day of growth this year is assumed to be about one and a half from the US, one from Russia, and two and a half uh, from, from OPEC. Now you have to ask why you would get that response from OPEC if you got the non-OPEC response that was assumed. But let's take each of those three pieces directly because I think this goes into where you can go with an energy transition. On the US side, we might be lucky to get half of what, what's assumed. The glass half full version of this is that investment's up. The inv in the fourth quarter, it rose by a third from the third quarter. So this is US listed companies, we call it the API 200, but it's 200 companies across the value chain that put in some $56 billion. But the two prior quarters were record lows. So it started from a low base, and this compares with a need if you had the same quarter in 2019 of over $70 billion at that point. That's per quarter. So that means we need 280, 300 billion a year out of those companies to keep pace with demand from 2019. Now, the next piece, Russia, you know with everything happening, the idea that you're going to get a million barrels per day of growth when refiners globally aren't touching Russian crude right now with a $20 barrel discount, that's a big question mark. Then the third part, OPEC, was assumed to put on 2.6 million barrels per day, but could barely agree to put on, by their own reporting, 590,000 barrels per day, 0 0.6 million barrels per day, not 2.6 to start this year. So we had a 3 million barrel per day deficit coming into the year. We have a lot of question marks. This sets us up for that kind of boom bust cycle that Bob was re referring to, where demand is back. In fact, it's at or above these 2019 levels. The investment and the production aren't. And it has been a combination of workforce, supply chain, high, high indebtedness, less capital availability. There's a firm uh, called Apicorp. They share our API, API Corp. It's a multilateral investment bank in the Middle East. They track investment plans across Middle East and North Africa. They show over five-year planning that, like, if you go back pre-COVID, 40%, actually 42, was oil and gas related. Post-COVID, and, and you see a dip first in the amount of total capital, and then it comes back the next year, but only about a fifth of it is oil and gas. So this is the other thing, as we're looking toward the energy transition, believe what you will, 
But if you take a relatively fixed pool of capital and you spread it over many proverbial more mouths to feed, it doesn't add up. You don't get something for nothing out of this. It's very capital intensive, as we've been saying. So we have real issues as we look forward. And we can't assume it away. We can't wish it away. We can not forecast it away. We have to be honest about the data. We have to under understand that in the OECD, including the United States, we have really good energy data. Internationally, we really don't. And we're reliant on the International Energy Agency to estimate it. That's another issue. Because if you look historically at the responsiveness to prices, the OECD economies, including the US, always showed some responsiveness through these cycles. The international ones don't. I'm an advisory board member of the African Energy Chamber. We have a lot of these discussions about what energy poverty means. I, I'm fully aligned with the messages. It's a massive disconnect in terms of expectations. There's a political overlay that goes with it. But this is a time with the current events that we're talking about with Russia, Ukraine, of stripping away all the politics and having a sincere discussion about how we pull industry, government, academics, everybody together into something that really is consistent with fostering energy security plus the environmental progress and economic affordability. Because I don't think you can have any one of those without the others. And in this sense, the, the energy security part of it has really fallen by the wayside. There's been an assumption that it would just be there because it has been there consistently for the last five or 10 years. And now we have some serious challenges. So with that, welcome questions. Phenomenal. So thank you very much. So the panel today has a series of policy practitioners, both in the short term and the long term. And I want to start with a question across the board. OK, historical examples. We've talked about history, price volatility. Can, I'm going to ask each of you to highlight, are there, have you seen in the historical past where there is a policy that actually, right, both enabled and achieved the results that we were looking for, where you see either you know, a, a positive policy example, or conversely, could you point to the disasters right, that you, uh, in, in a historical example? And with that, I'm just going to go right down the row. OK. Um, well, to Bob McNally's illustration, I think the, at the federal level, it was the Connolly Hot Oil Act, I think, of 1933. Right? Um, Tom Connolly was a Texas senator that enabled the Railroad Commission and with the, the cooperation of the Oklahoma Corporation Commission to set prices. And they did from roughly 1933 to 1973. So, but that's a long time ago. I mean, and, but in terms of modern policy, I, 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 you're gonna have a hard time, I have a very difficult time finding one example of a policy that has bolstered affordability, resilience, and reliability. Instead, I see a lot of these policies, particularly subsidies, excessive subsidies for renewables, excessive subsidies for EVs, distorting the market and, and reducing affordability, resilience, and reliability. Well, in terms of uh, global energy security, I don't think we have exploited uh, the U.S. shale revolution to the extent we should have. So this is one thing. The other, uh, it's more about Europe, I think uh, some decisions by Germany uh, have been disastrous, uh, shutting down their nuclear uh, plants. And uh, I hope they will reverse some of it because they're thinking about it. Um, and of course, um, as I said earlier, uh, making themselves so much dependent on, on Russian energy. There are some good things too. The French are sticking to, uh, to nuclear. Uh, the Belgians are, have reversed uh, some of the decisions, which is a, a good decision. Uh, so as most of the Central Europeans understand that nuclear has to be part of, uh, of, of the energy mix uh, long term. So I think, look, look there, it's a mixed bag. It, it really is a mixed bag. But I, I would argue that uh, a lot of rethink thinking has to happen in the, in the next, next few months. Dean, any? Very quickly, the things that stick out. One is National Energy Technology Lab funding for shale in the early years that led to you know, what really took off in the Barnett in 2005. That it's an example and one of the few where you can really see in government funding helping innovation that really diffused. Diffusion is a key word that 
when we talk about technology, even if you had an elephant find of something, a breakthrough with totally commercial fusion technology tomorrow, the ability to diffuse proprietary te technologies through global markets is something that academics has historically done a lot of studies on that we need to continue to, uh, to focus on. Another policy shift that's been really important was the lifting of the crude oil export ban uh, at the end of 2015, you know, entering 2016. And by our estimates, that saved refiners some $50 billion a year in the United States. It's been tremendous. If there was something that really changed global oil markets, it was the US being able to participate and export the light sweet crude oil that's been in abundance here. So trade relations is something that's fallen by the wayside. And secretly, we've got to push post-COVID to re-domicile, to bring everything back home in terms of supply chains. And by the way, there is no energy security with an all renewables EV kind of view unless you have the entire value chain supported through. Because otherwise, you're just buying components from China or somewhere else today. At one price, the US dollar changes value over 15 years. And when you have to buy that solar panel or wind turbine again, it could be a completely different price in 15 years. So the US dollar status and a macro backdrop where digital currencies and everything are, are continuing to, to eat away at its special status around the world, these are serious issues. But again, trade relations normalizing more focus in North America, cooperation with Canada and Mexico. These should be things unraveling steel tariffs. These are things that would directly help the industry, help production in the industry, and improve the connectivity and the economic benefits that go with it. Yeah, I, uh, I need to add something. Where well, first of all, uh, Europeans are not. They don't. Uh, Europeans don't understand that business is part of the solution. So the private sector is part of the solution. And I keep talking to them. Some understand, some most don't. Um, the US, and I'm more familiar with the gas industry, the LNG industry, they have been incredibly uh, good at adapting to the demands, the global demands uh, for methane capture, uh, flaring. I mean, this is all happening. And I just don't think they're getting enough credit uh, for this. And then finally, let's face it, right now we wouldn't be in this situation if we had a better uh, uh, LNG infrastructure in the United States, not just in Europe, in the United States. And I think that was a big mistake. If I can yeah, jump, in, jump in again here, because <clears throat> I earlier talked about Connolly Hot Oil Act and, and what's happened in the U.S., but if we talk about policy and energy transition, let's look at China, where you have a very muscular central government saying this is what we're going to do. So I don't know how many of you saw it, but China just announced they're going to increase coal production by 300 million tons a year. They are going to try to eliminate all coal imports. So in, at, a, at a stroke, the NRDC, the Central Planning Agency in China, said we're going to increase domestic coal production by half of what is current U.S. coal production. And also that's almost nearly half of India's current coal production. They produce about 750 million tons a year. So China has a very muscular industrial energy policy that also includes their approach to nuclear energy, which, in my view, we're, we're completely stuck. And if we're going to, if the United States as a whole is going to have any kind of nuclear industry at all, we need sustained, and I've testified before the Senate on this very issue, sustained long-term, decadal, bipartisan support for nuclear. But we don't have it. And I'm glad to blame the Sierra Club and, because they're guilty for this. I mean, and the Democratic Party has been the party of the Sierra Club for 50 years. They've not said a word positive about nuclear energy for 50 years until their 2020, uh, uh, their most recent Democratic platform. Um, but finally, this national energy policy regarding the transition, it's going to be about metals and minerals. And I long several set of slides that I could talk about. The DOE just put out a, a report last month 92 or 94 percent of the neodymium iron boron dysprosium magnets that are produced in the world are produced in China. So all the permanent magnets needed for onshore wind turbines, offshore wind turbines, for electric vehicles are being produced in China. And the U.S. has no strategy for any of this. And the Biden administration will talk about batteries. I've yet to see them talk about neodymium, dysprosium, praseodymium, all of, the, all of the lanthanides that are the green elements that are going to be needed for any of this energy transition. So the idea that the U.S. as a policy is going to say, oh, yeah, we're just going to trust the Chinese, 
It's a bad idea. Uh, yes, it is. And so with that, I want to <laughs> move to uh, move to questions from the audience. And so I'm going to ask Ann to help kind of facilitate. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, and if not, trust me, I've got a million questions. But I think we've got one right here in the back or making over. Uh, I, I want to compliment TCU. I'm an alum. I'm from Kilgore. I asked one of the earlier speakers that they know where Kilgore is. And, you know, that's the center of the world's largest oil field in the lower 48. Uh, that field uh, potentially will produce 6 billion barrels of oil. Our competition is the mega oil producers who want to shut down our three-barrel-a-day wells. They said it would be closed in 1990, but we've been keep producing over and over. We have an abundance of natural gas, lignite coal plants, and someone has decided to close the coal plants. And yet you're saying in Germany they ought to crank up the nuclear. I'm saying who made the policy to close down our coal plants when we have a shortage of energy? So who, who makes the policy? Does anybody know that? Do you know why we have a 75 mile an hour speed limit? <laughs> to increase production. Increase production, which increases the price of taxes on so, fuel coming to the state. So, Think about it. It's a tr we, we're taxing you because you're driving 75. We appreciate you driving 75. Why don't we have a 55? Who made the policy? Why haven't we gone back to 55 miles in a gallon? You know, yep. who, all of a sudden, two-year elections coming up, four-year elections. Someone said earlier that the transition of policymakers are going through a transition that the other policymakers have no idea right. why we have an energy yep. policy. And so, so with that, the question is, do you support closing Texas coal-fired power plants? Okay. And why would you support that? Thank so, you. Let me take that. And uh, I'm actually going to start at the end this time with American Petroleum Institute. Dean? Dean? <laughs> All of the above. And in this environment, there's no question that you continue to need it. You're, as you were going on, I was thinking, you know, there are several things that are um, notably true about it. And it is both the need for power and continued environmental progress. The federal government is enforcing policies, but it's been, like, it, some of the minerals that you were describing, Robert, you know, I mean, they can be hard for anybody to pronounce, but we've got a Secretary of Energy that up until recently would not utter the words natural gas. Wouldn't say it, ban staff from saying it. And despite the administration going in the media and saying we're doing everything we can to lower prices at the pump, we had in the fourth quarter a proposal to all but eliminate natural gas in U.S. power. We've had proposed higher taxes, rebanning of exports. We still have a moratorium on leasing, you know, access to resources. We've had an attack on infrastructure, pulling the environmental permit on the Keystone XL pipeline on day one, continuing to threaten the Dakota Access Pipeline. So, look, Gas, coal, all of this feeding a resilient, reliable power network is something that we can't take for granted. You saw it in the winter storms last year in Texas. It only happens if you have market mechanisms and capacity markets that continue to balance these things and make sure that the interconnectedness is there. And you know, just the oil price increase that we've seen recently, that alone is the equivalent of more than $100 per ton kind of tax. If you were looking at EPA's conversion models of you know, what this means in energy equivalents, this is a really expensive carbon tax, basically, that we've just seen by virtue of not a physical disruption to supply, but the threat of it, right? So the administration, their agenda is an environmental agenda. They actually like these high prices. They just don't want political accountability for them. So keep in mind that their view of the only way to make environmental progress, in their view, is to have things that incentivize people to move off of fossil fuels. So as the policies are enacted, whether it's difficulty in citing and permitting things, whether it's 
through air or water regulations, across the gamut, it's been an all-out assault on fossil fuels. So as we're trying to engage and get caught up on this, their playbook has really been to shift externally, to say, go to OPEC, uh, go to Abu Dhabi, ask for more oil production. Go to Qatar and ask for more natural gas production. You've seen the headlines where they've gone recently to negotiate with Venezuela. So this is really interesting, right? You don't want that coal plant here at home. You don't want a direct import of Russian crude, but you're perfectly happy to take Russian-owned assets out of Venezuela. Right. It, it's night and day. Mr. Ambassador, could you give a yeah, perspective? You know, I'm... I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of coal. I'm a great fan of gas. I think we should tra transition to gas as, as quickly as possible. That's really my, my view on this. Let me ask you from a European perspective, where do European policies, now that we understand the EU structure and the sovereign nation authorities, where in the EU do we look to see policy indicators coming out on exactly that question? Well, I, I think a couple of things. First of all, look to Brussels. Brussels is is really reasonable. Some of the smaller countries, uh, some some of the. Can you some, say that again because I, that just shocked me. No, really, me a bit. really, really. Some, yeah, but you might not. You, wow. You, you might you might not recognize that, but <laughs> but uh, I, I talk to 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 many of these. You know, I, I talk to colleagues there, and many of them are really reasonable. It doesn't mean that uh, they all get to, you know, get their say, but but I would say there is a difference between the declared goals uh, by Brussels and what, what countries actually do, and the fact is that Germany is burning more coal than ever before, and guess where the coal is coming from? It's not coming from the United States, right? It's coming right. from another big power uh, closer to Germany. So therefore, I think there is this double uh, double speak uh, in Europe, and uh, and, uh, you know, some countries just ha want to have it both ways. Yep. Robert? Sure. I'll jump in on the coal issue. Um, I live in Austin. I was blacked out, my wife and I, for 45 hours beginning at 2 a.m. last February 15th. And I've been studying the blackout essentially nonstop ever since. It is very clear in the wake of the blackouts that the plants that did the best, that performed the best during the crisis, were the plants that had on-site fuel, the coal and nuclear plants. I think it's clear now, especially after February 24th, when Russia invaded Ukraine, we need to focus on energy security, and that means variety of supply. Churchill said it, what, 1908, like the most famous energy quote ever. <laughs> energy security lies in variety and variety alone. I, I'm pro-natural gas, but it's a just-in-time fuel. And what we saw in Texas was there wasn't enough to go around, and now mm -hmm. ratepayers are going to get hit with multi-billions of dollars in costs for both the securitized debt and also because the RTO model is fundamentally broken because ERCOT and the way we're managing our electric grid is not designed to, uh, to ensure reliability and resilience. So I, I think at this point we should not be closing coal plants and not a one of them. We're the Saudi Arabia of coal and we should be using it. Climate change is a concern. It's not the only concern. Um, but yeah, I think that this, this issue now, I mean, look at, to go back to Europe, who is the most energy secure in terms of the electric grid in Europe now? I'd argue it's Poland. And Poland said to the EU, and the EU said, oh, stop burning coal. Poland said, yeah, sure, right. We have a lot of history with, with Russia, and it's all bad. We're not going to rely on their gas, and we're going to burn coal. Yeah, but also because Poland embraced US LNG early on. Well, fair so, enough, but that's so the, the yeah, yeah. Of, well, that's yeah, but it, but it is important. I, I yeah. agree with you. They're reasonable, and they want a reasonable tra transition from coal. And I think I think you're right. It's it's an energy secure country. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador. What was phenomenal in what you said was that Poland embraced U.S. United States natural gas as part of their national security strategy. Um, and I love how that sounds. With that, I'm going to go to a question here. You, could, could you stand up and speak loud? Yeah. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for, for uh, being here. The one thing I haven't heard a lot about today was coal. And if you say natural gas is taboo, man, coal has been really pushed away. I have failed to, in my research. I, it's just gotten so far out of scope of what we do, focusing on natural gas and renewable percentages. Has there been any new policy in Europe, China, I say that, the United States and really putting serious investment, seeing if it's possible to reduce the emissions put off by coal. Because you say clean coal, some places you travel north of Europe, almost kicked out of the room. 
any thought on, on future investment for scientific breakthroughs policy to see if there's any cleaner way to, to burn this stuff? Okay, yeah, well, let me start here. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the European Commission, uh, and, and it goes through their credit, uh, last year adopted the so-called Green Deal, right? And there's a price tag, and they're ready to invest $800 billion to, to support this transition. Uh, and part of that, big part of that, is goes to uh, research and uh, research and development. <coughs> and so, so I would say that uh, uh, there is there is a lot of lot of thinking thinking out there. But he, here's the issue. Here's the issue, and this is something that has come up today many times. Um, the social impact of too fast transition has never really been researched. We put forward, I work at the Atlantic Council, we put forward the study proposal two years ago to figure out how this green vest, yellow vest thing works because there, these are the two extremes and both are, both are dangerous. And guess what, nobody wanted to take that, that project. We, what we were going to say is be careful because if you don't understand that there's only so, so much society can absorb in terms of fast transition, then you're going to have collapse, you're going to have a disaster on your hand. And that's really a problem, and, if it's a, and, and I think it's, 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 it's a much bigger problem in Europe than Europeans would want to. You know, I'll be blunt here, and because I was fascinated by this, today's conversation, and I want to, I, I want to applaud the, the university for making this possible, because we were able to raise questions that are in other places politically not correct, and you cannot uh, not raise it. But let's face it, how is it that the world, world leaders are led by a 20-year-old Swedish pampered girl <laughs> who has never ever had to suffer anything in her life? The worst thing that could happen is that she had to sit in front of her school and protest. That's not suffering. Suffering is what happened in Ukraine, what happened in Eastern Europe under communist domination, what happened in Sweden was left out of it, what happened in the Second World, that's suffering. So don't tell me, don't tell me a 20-year-old has to design. And I think we're slowly getting over it, but I think this was the moment where I allowed myself to say this. You can kill me afterwards. Yeah. Uh, but I think it also speaks to the honesty and sincerity of this conversation, which I really, really, once again, applaud. Thank you. Absolutely. Dean, go ahead. Just to be on point with your question, the National Energy Technology Laboratory has a treasure trove of research on levelized costs of electricity, the cost of implementing CCGT with coal, with natural gas, compares it. And you can look at, you can take that apart. And they have spreadsheet models and everything else. So I think it's, it is a rich area. A lot of coal transition things haven't happened because it's really hard to build coal. It's been impossible to build coal in most states. Mm -hmm. And natural gas supplanting coal has resulted in some really good environmental performance along the way. It's, it's led to lower emissions. So, but we I'll, can't I'll trade it and not have the production, and that becomes an issue. I'll just jump in real quickly. Um, clean coal to me is an oxymoron, like jumbo shrimp or family vacation. All right, it's just you know. <laughs> I'm using so many quotes from today's panel; it's amazing. <laughs> this is awesome. It, it's oxymoronic, yeah. but that said, I do believe cleaner coal. And what we've seen is a move toward cleaner coal, ultra supercritical awesome. plants. The Japanese are building ultra supercritical. You, I don't see any way to reduce the CO2 emissions. I do see a way to get more energy per, per, per embedded, embedded chemical right. energy in the coal. Um, but the, the attack on coal is clear. It's a war on coal. The, 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 the climate activists mm -hmm. have made coal their primary target. And it's not just the regulatory part of this. On the Power Hungry podcast about three weeks ago, I had Joe Kraft, the CEO of Alliance Resource Partners. They're the, lar the second largest coal producer in the eastern U.S. They have 14 banks, 12 banks, no, 14 banks in their revolving line of credit. Seven of them are pulling out because of ESG. Right. So final round uh, and to the last question. This is a speed question, and then I'm going to go across for short answers from the panel. Go. Uh, I'm Murad. Uh, 
First of all, I want to thank uh, TCU for giving us this opportunity. Uh, second, um, for Dion, you have a really good experience in the oil companies. Is there any uh, research that shows maybe one day the oil will stop, like will stop producing oil? And in the second question, you mentioned something about mix energy, which is that will be solving the problem for the coal mine that closed. And is that something we can use? And I saw that in Germany one time when I was in Germany, and there is a uh, small towns being destroyed because there is a coal in these towns. And in the same time, what they did, they built a wind farm right beside that area. And in the in the, in the same area, they built a solar farm to use to generate all these machines that work in. With the, this is will be considered a mixed energy. Okay. Thank you so much. Got it. Work down the road. Robert? Um, uh, he was asking Dean. I'm not okay, sure. Dean, <laughs> okay. Defer. There, let's defer and start with Dean. Go. So there's a lot there, and I'm happy to talk offline with you. As far as the future of oil, um, the mess, its energy density characteristics and the existing embedded transportation system make it hard to push off of. In terms of whether you run out of it, tell me the price, and I'll tell you how much there is. There is no... It, and I just spent a week and a half ago, I was in Colorado, I met with the governor's office. You know, there's another Saudi Arabia worth of oil sitting in Colorado. It's kerogen based shale oil. So if you tell me a price forecast, I can tell you what you need to, for these resources to become economic. Shale oil globally has a lot more potential. The recovery factors, a decade ago, you know, when the, this was just taking off, nobody really understood exactly why it worked. Empirically, they got it to work. But the recovery factors continue to improve. And stuff that used to be considered, and everybody says, oh, there are only so many good low well locations. There are only so many sweet spots. Well, the stuff that was tier two, tier three a decade ago is the most productive ever right now. So let's take that offline. As far as the, we made the point in a mineral context about you have to have the value chain in mining to be able to have energy security with an energy transition. Uh, there's no question that the environmental performance in coal, in heavy oil, these are controversial issues. It's not just not in my backyard, but you have to have strong enforcement to make sure that the environmental reclamation goes with it. Canada has done an excellent job with that, and even then it's not without controversy. So again, let's talk offline on it, but okay. that's the short so, answer. One, so, so because this is probably the last remark I'll make here. So for, first of all, I, 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 I believe that oil and gas will be with us long term. So you should not worry about that. And there will be a big shift from burning, burning uh, gas and coal to using gas and coal for, 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 uh, for other, other stuff. But I'd, I'd like to just conclude by saying my big worry today is that once the Russians move out of Ukraine, uh, our knees will uh, get weak, and suddenly we'll be back to old habits. And my biggest worry is that Germany, while it did suspend Nord Stream 2, the pipe, the controversial uh, pipeline, that it will not uh, terminate the project, but will will restart the project. So that's a worry worry I have. Uh, and the, the final thing I want to say, and. Uh, the Atlantic Council is looking forward to working very, very closely with you on big projects, including including figuring out how can we part of rebuilding Ukraine. Well, we figured that out last night. We're going to start a TCU campus in Kiev, right? <laughs> that was step one. Quick comment to Murad's uh, question, which is the more oil we find, the more oil we find. The more gas we find, the more gas we find. Uh, I'm, I'm a technology optimist. Um, but if we're serious about climate change, we have to get serious about nuclear, and we have to do it right damn now. So uh, this concludes this panel on policy. As a board of advisor, I understood that we have some challenges before us. To the students in the room, you are challenged to learn the lingua franca and the structures that were talked about today. This is part of your business and your industry. To the business members and the uh, industry participants, the decisions we make today have not only economic but national security implications. We must take that very seriously. And to TCU, TCU has an inherent strategic charter to be that neutral convener in which we can have open and honest conversations. And let us remember that Texas Christian University has a role in national security 
and geopolitics globally. And with that, Anne, thank you very much. Thank you.